Now, the history of church buildings is pretty neat. The word church is originally intended. It had nothing to do with buildings because official church buildings didn't come in vogue until the 4th century. The word that's been translated to us as church in the Bible is the Greek word ecclesia or ecclesia, meaning called out ones. Tradition says that the site of the Last Supper became the first church, but the first real record we have of the ecclesia being referred to as a meeting place was from Clement of Alexandria in 190 AD. But that had more to do with meeting in private homes or beneath the streets and catacombs to venerate the bones of martyrs. The oldest known purpose-built Christian church is located in Akaba, Jordan, built between 293 and 303 CE, a small three-aled basilica design that could seat about 60. But when Christianity became a legal religion in 313 CE, and the emperor of Rome declared himself Christian, Constantine preferred buildings that resembled the Basilica, large Roman public buildings with multiple functions, typically built alongside the town's forum as worship spaces. And many of our current church customs are still rooted in the practices that developed in these buildings. On the outside, basilicas looked pretty plain, but inside, oh baby. And many were built atop catacombs and cemeteries that held the bones of the saints, ascribing to the belief that the bones of saints still had their relevant powers. And early basilicas faced east to west so that the sun fell on the speaker at the altar. And the altar in these churches was a holdover from Greco-Roman pagan temples, as the altar would hold the bones of a martyr and the Eucharistic function. Now, some of you might go, wait a minute, Ken, the Hebraic faith used altars? And you're right. But their altars looked quite different, were for completely different functions, and definitely didn't hold the bones of saints. Remember, by the 4th century, Jews and Christians had completely split. And Christian converts were mostly Gentiles, not Jews. And anti-Semitism was widespread. So church altars had very little to do with those of the Hebraic faith. In fact, up until the Middle Ages, if you didn't have some kind of holy relic at the altar, your church wasn't even considered legitimate. There is also a special chair at the altar reserved for the speaker, representing the speaker's authority. And we still do this today. And this is also a holdover from earlier Greco-Roman belief systems. But the biggest thing with officially designated church buildings was the marked shift away from the early Christian community gathering model. As followers of the way wouldn't all gather facing one way at a single speaker, but instead gathered round. Church was more about community than, well, getting preached at. But this all changed with official church buildings. Rituals were developed that we still see today in some settings. The walking in of incense or candles, the lighting of lights when the priests enter. And all of these things were holdovers of customs from Roman temples, as this occurred whenever Caesar or his officials entered pagan temples, as was the Roman custom of opening service with professional and processional music, which was how earlier religions in Rome opened their time of worship. Now, after the Basilica phase, the building style generally went to the Byzantine phase, which began to integrate Platonic designs, stained glass, inducing color to affect mood, that sort of stuff. And this is still with us today as well. I mean, notice the use of greens when it's time for an offering, or the reds during altar call, purples during solemn moments. Now, I'm not lowering an indictment on this, but these ideas, which are designed to elicit emotional responses, they've been around a long, long time. And after the Reformation, the pulpit became the center focus of the Protestant church, shifting attention to the sermon instead of a building's ambiance that was designed to impact contemplation. But most church buildings still have a narthex where you go up a short flight of stairs, enter a small room before going into the actual sanctuary. And that was designed to subconsciously prepare the soul in moving from a secular to a sacred space. Also, the altar rail and raising up of the speaker onto a platform symbolized the separation of the congregant to the access and nearness of God, symbolically demonstrating the effort the congregant needed to make to enter into the Holy Presence. There's a design to every church building that exists that we take for granted, but the original designs all had a spiritual reasoning. And I can seriously keep going. All in all, the church building, as it was designed in the fourth century into the present day, was a setting aside of sacred space, a place that was venerable. And I love church buildings. I do. I grew up in them. But making a church building more indicative and symbolic of our faith than the people in them, the actual church, the called out ones, 
creates a problem. Honoring the building more than the people, it creates a dividing line in the heart and the soul, making a building more symbolic of our faith rather than who we are, our identity, our actual, our very being as children of God, symbolizes the separation of the secular and the spiritual. But in truth, there's no separation. If our model is Jesus, he did not separate the secular from the spiritual. To the ancient Hebrew mind, that, was a, that concept didn't exist. And it creates disjunction in our minds. I go to worship instead of living a life of worship. I go to church instead of I am the church. And this is all up in our modern language. Ever heard a pastor say, welcome to the house of the Lord. Or thanks for coming this Sunday to the Father's house. But that is not scriptural. In fact, that is a thoroughly pagan concept, and we make an error when we say that. Unlike pagan gods, the Christian God doesn't live in buildings of stone. God's people are his temple, and Acts 7, 48-50, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, and 1 Peter 2, 5 are just a few verses that confirm this. Want to know where God actually lives? Look at your hands. You want to see the hands of Jesus? He lives in you. Look at your hands. You want to see what the power of the Holy Spirit can do? Look at your hands. We have to start living in spirit and in truth and take on the responsibility that if Jesus lives inside of us, we need to be the hands. Buildings are just that. Buildings. I love them. But God doesn't live in them. He lives in us. And when we say a building is the house of God, we are in essence saying that I have to go somewhere else to experience God. Whereas in truth, he's already living in me. And that's John 17, 20 through 23. So can you encounter God in a building? Absolutely, yes. Because in a church, you will find believers, so you will find him there. But a building is just that, a building. Can church buildings have a power to them? Yeah, for sure. I've experienced it. But does God live in them? God lives in people, and his glory is everywhere. The religious spirit and the spirit of man seeks to keep God quantified in temples instead of believers stepping into the reality that we are God's temples. The church is something we are. But most of us truly don't believe that. Our language betrays us. We say cute mottos like, church is not a building, it's a family. But do you say I'm going to family this Sunday morning? Look, I love church. And yes, we should never forsake the assembly of the saints, but the assembly of the saints has nothing to do with designated buildings. And when our building budgets are greater than our mission outreach budgets, when we are focused more on building improvements than in the health of our fellow man, we got problems. Jesus isn't coming back for buildings. And at the end of your days, he's not going to ask you how many buildings you built or how many people you fit in them. He's going to ask you if you loved and lived with everything you had, if you loved him, and if you loved your neighbor as you loved yourself. And I hope that we all have the strength to answer accordingly.